Our gospel reading today comes from the book of Matthew. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets, and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. The Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung called them archetypal dreams. They are dreams we all have with similar storylines that seem to grow out of our unconscious mind. They reveal what we don't easily face during our waking moments. For example, the legendary baseball player Mickey Mantle had a recurring dream that he was trying desperately to get his uniform on, but he was looking at the game through a knothole in the outfield fence, unable to get onto the field. And I think a lot of us have this recurring dream that we're running across the college campus in a state of undress, trying to find the classroom where we're supposed to take our final exam. Uh, I have one where I'm in the bathroom in my office up the stairs here, and I'm listening to the organ playing and the congregation singing, and I'm trying desperately to get myself suited up for the sermon because I know you're waiting for me here in the pulpit. What's all that about? It seems to derive from our fear of failure, our feeling that we may be unprepared in some way, or a sense that maybe we're going to be found out and thrown out because we're not ready to belong. When I read this parable Jesus tells about the man at the wedding banquet who is found without a wedding robe and is thrown out into outer darkness, I wonder if it's like a bad dream that is telling us something we need to pay attention to in our waking moments. Moments like now, But let's not rush too fast to the conclusion. There's lots of parable to attend to before we get there. Matthew records Jesus telling a parable about the kingdom of heaven. This is one of a number of so-called parables of judgment that we have been looking at across the past few weeks. In the original setting, Jesus was being challenged by religious authorities about his wandering outside the fold of Israel to fraternize with Gentiles. He ate and drank with them, people considered to be dirty, unclean. The purity culture of Judaism was intended to remind Jews that they are a distinct people who should be holy as God is holy, but it sometimes had the shadow effect 
of closing them off to the profligate love of God for all people, including unholy humanity. Jesus' understanding of holiness is less about keeping away from the wrong people than it is about keeping faith with God's mission to all people. He calls his people to remember that they are to be a light to the nations. But holiness is always easier to maintain by segregation than integration, isn't it? So he tells this parable of a wedding banquet thrown by a king for his son. A wedding banquet was a common image of the messianic age in which God would come to be one with the world, a union like a marriage, in other words, and there would be an ongoing feast. Well, the king sends out invitations and finds that those who are invited as the likely guests seem to have other things to do. They are preoccupied with their own agendas and they decline to come. In fact, some go so far even as to attack and kill the messengers of the king, the servants, which is a clear allusion to the prophets whose message the people rejected time and again. The king is enraged and sends his troops to destroy their city. But the king is intent on his son's wedding being honored. So he sends his servants out into the streets to invite all. There's that key word, all. Everyone they can find is welcome. Hmm. Open to all, closed to none. Always open to all. Hmm. Does that sound familiar, Wilshire? In its original setting, Jesus is chiding his own people for closing their hearts to sinners. He wants Gentiles, as well as Jews, to know the unconditional love and welcome of God. But Matthew's Jesus is an equal opportunity offender, don't you know? By the time Matthew gets round to telling this story some 50 years after Jesus' earthly ministry, something else is happening. The church that is now full of Gentiles, people like you and me, may have begun to see itself as the true Israel, the rightful heir of God's promises. Most Jews had rejected Jesus and the church has now superseded Israel as the true people of God. This is a heresy we have to name. Jews have reasons not to believe Jesus is the Messiah, even if we believe he is. To name just one, the prophets foretold that when Messiah comes, he will usher in the age of peace and justice, a, a, a universal time when all things are set right. To look at the world as it is, even now, including the fact that the church that declares that Jesus is Lord has had such an influence on the world as we know it, it's hard for them to see that this is so. But the non-belief of Jews in Jesus, not unbelief, non-belief, doesn't mean God is finished with them. Jews continue to hallow the name of God and hold out this universal vision for the world. And when the church rejects Jews as the people of God and attempts to take their place, we are guilty of presumption. We have not replaced Jews as God's people. We have joined them adding our unique 
witness alongside theirs. So we have no independent claim to truth that doesn't depend upon our relationship to the people of God, Israel. We bear witness to the one who both unites us and separates us, Jesus. And he calls all of us to join the party God is throwing for everybody. Here's where it gets interesting in the parable though. All these people who show up to the wedding banquet, they are the bad and the good alike, Matthew says. That is Gentiles as well as Jews. And looking closely at this, we see an important principle involved in the gospel, and that is inclusion before exclusion. Too often we think God has a limited guest list. And we are lucky if God has put us on it. But that's not the way this works. Many are called, but few are chosen, we hear in this text, doesn't mean more than you think are eligible and fewer than that will actually make it in the end. It's instead a way of saying that those who know themselves to have been called have a great responsibility to answer that call by living up to it. Do you hear that, church? Which is why we get this ending. The king notices that one is there without a wedding robe on. He is at the party, but by his dress, he disrespects the king and dishonors the king's son. He wants to be there, but on his own terms. He has shown up, but he hasn't suited up. He's on the team, so to speak, but he won't get in the game. He wants all the benefits without the responsibilities that go with it. When Matthew's church heard the language of wedding robe, they would have instinctively thought about the baptismal robe. You see, back in those early days of the church, when people were baptized, they would walk naked into a river so as to say that there is no distinction among people, whether rich or poor, whether circumcised or uncircumcised. But when they came up from the water, they were given a robe, the same robe as everyone else, that signified their new life and new status in Christ. This parable must have been a terrifying warning to those who heard it in Matthew's church. A warning that they not celebrate their inclusion and then turn around and refuse to join the joy of God's inclusion of everyone else. A warning that they not take off their baptismal robe that signified living in the spirit of Christ and revert to their old ways of judging and separating from others. The church in America today needs to hear this parable afresh. John Pavlovich is a prophet calling on Christians to live up to our baptisms. He recently said this, I'm tired of professed Christians preaching a Jesus that they seem to have no interest at all in emulating of religious people being a loud, loveless noise in the world while claiming to speak for a God who is supposedly love, I'm starting a new church. The church of not being horrible. Our mission statement is simply this, don't be horrible to people. Don't treat them as less worthy of love, respect, dignity, joy, and opportunity than you are. Don't create caricatures out of them based on their skin color, their religion, their sexual orientation, the amount of money they have, the circumstances they find themselves in. Don't seek to take away from them things you already enjoy in abundance. Civil rights, clean water, education, 
marriage, access to health care. Don't tell someone's story for them about why they are poor, depressed, addicted, victimized, alone. Well, that's a start, I suppose. But I want to say I don't think it's enough for us not to be horrible. Right? We are baptized into Christ. And as such, we are called to be active, positive, passionate about loving and welcoming and celebrating the good news of God that includes not just us, but all whom God has called. And there's that little word again, all. Wilshire, we have done what we can to declare in every way possible God's love and welcome for all, and we have celebrated our own inclusion. We have shown up for membership with all of its privileges, but have we suited up for service? The challenge of the ending to this parable is before us always. Being a Christian is more than just celebrating our identity as children of God in Christ. It's also about acting like it. Whether, in other words, we take up the mission of God once we have accepted our acceptance. The church doesn't run itself. It takes all of us putting on our robes, suiting up, and going to work. It takes saying yes to our duties to build a community of faith shaped by the spirit of Jesus Christ. I know this time of COVID-19 restriction has been challenging. Boy, do I know. But we, we all find ways to join in for the things that matter to us most. And the church goes on too. So suit up and join in. Don't presume upon your privilege, or you might just find the Lord staring at you, speechless, wondering why you are here if you are not participating in the grand and glad festivities. Amen.